Okay, so here we are. So uh, I'll be referring back to this as well as my tip and trick, right, as we go through into our Visual Studio. So I'm going to start off with File New Project, as we talked about. Now here, right, it's pretty good. Uh, it's already set on C Sharp. <laughs> One time the image always started on Visual Basic and you had to switch all the time to a different language. So that was a little bit of a pain. Every once in a while we'd all forget and you'd find yourself looking at Visual Basic. I love Visual Basic. You know, I have nothing against it, but it's not what we do here. So under web, you'll see .NET Core. So that's where we want to be, right? By the way, if you're determined to do a web form project, which I think you have to do in your RAD course, uh, it is still here under previous versions, right? In previous versions, you can still get to it. So there's your web form site, right? So there's your ASPX pages like you were doing last term. But we're focusing on .NET Core and this one right here, ASP.NET Core Web Application. Okay, now don't click OK yet. You want to browse for my working folder. So I'll go to this PC, down to the C drive, and there is my working folder. So I'll select that folder, right? But notice I do have this checkbox down here, Create Directory for Solution. That's on by default, so it will make a... A, a folder for the solution itself. Now I can give a name. By the way, you might wonder why there's a separate name and solution name. A solution in Visual Studio can contain multiple projects, right? You, you'll often have like a test project and uh, maybe a web API project as well as an MVC project all together in one solution, right? So when I give a name here, it becomes by default the name of the solution, but it doesn't have to be. I could change it. But this is fine for us for now. So I'm just going to call it medical office core. I'm going to say core because I don't want to confuse it with my old medical office examples from previous <laughs> .NET framework examples. And that should be fine. Okay, so I'll click OK. And then we get more choices. Wow, good, right? Well, there we go. Uh, a web application using model view controller. Okay, that's what we want. We talked a little bit about Docker support. We won't do that right now, but we'll worry about that later in the course. And there's that configure for HTTPS. Unfortunately, we can't actually use HTTPS on these systems in our lab, but that's not a problem. I, I'm not going to worry about that right now. What I do want to do is change authentication because I'm planning ahead, right? We are going to have individual user accounts where people log in with a username and password. It's a very powerful and extensible system. You can set it up so that, you know, as long as the web service where you're hosting this supports it, it can be set up to uh, send text messages out with a code, you know, to confirm that they're logging in two-factor authentication, uh, reset their password by having it send an email with a link to click and then times out after, you know, whatever, one hour, five hours, 24 hours, whatever you want, things like that. That's all possible with this system, right? So that's individual user accounts. By the way, the worker school accounts, that's more or less just Active Directory, either in Azure or locally. And Windows authentication, well, that's just logging into Windows. That's useful if your application is a intranet as opposed to internet, right? Intranet really just means you're using HTTP and TCP, but only within a local area network. Right? It's not visible to the outside world. It's just within the company. Okay, so for us, though, the individual user accounts is the way to go. And the users, uh, the store will be inside our application itself in a SQL Server database by default, right? You could change that if you really wanted to, but that's the default. Okay, so when I click OK, ooh, notice that. My checkbox is grayed out. It has to be selected in order to do the security system. So that's why we have to have a different workaround. So I'll click OK, and we'll watch it bake. Unfortunately, it doesn't take too long, so I don't need my Jeopardy music. Right. Okay, you get the idea. All right, so here we are. So now I have my solution up. My template is just the default template here. We'll talk a bit about how it works, but we might as well deal with that HTTPS issue. Let me just show you the issue, just for completeness. So I'll run the application. It takes a little while the first time, because here I need Jeopardy. Right? Well, and then it comes up says, oh, this project is configured to use SSL, right? To avoid SSL warnings in the browser, you can choose to trust the self-signed certificate that IIS Express has generated. That would be great if we could, but... 
access is denied, okay? On the image, we aren't given permission, okay? They don't want us to break things, so they've locked down some permissions. This wasn't done on purpose, it just was, was done, all right? So that's a kind of a problem. We can't really run this. If I let it continue on, it'll come up and just say it won't be able to access the server, right? Connection failed because it insists on an HTTPS connection, which I cannot facilitate. Can you just take off the S? Is it going to work? Uh, let's try it. No, it won't. Connection was reset. Try again, and then it'll force it to go back to HTTPS. Good thought, though. Okay, but there is a solution, and basically, as, as pointed out in Blackboard, over here in the uh, Solution Explorer, you'll see Properties, right? Just double-click on Properties, and you get, uh, it's, it's actually a configuration file, but it has this nice little interface for us to make changes. So there's little tabs down the side. You can change aspects of how the build happens, build events, how it gets packaged up, and so on. But here under Debug, if we scroll down... There are web server settings, right? And right here, under web server settings, this is under the debug area, is enable SSL. All you really have to do is uncheck that. Now it will run without insisting upon HTTPS, okay? Uh, the first time I looked up help on this issue, I, I found in a blog somewhere, somebody recommended also doing something else that is the fourth point in my instructions. Uh, in the startup.cs file, comment out this uh, directive to use HTTP redirection. Uh, it seems to work without doing that, but you know, it, maybe <laughs> maybe it's worthwhile. It's something you can always just remove the comments later on when you're going to deploy. So if you come to your startup.cs file down here under the configuration section, here it is, right? Among other things, it wants us to use the HTTPS redirection, so we can just comment that out. It actually, I've tested it, it runs without doing that, but maybe there'll be some circumstances where that's a help as well, so it's easy to undo later on if it's ever a problem. Okay, so now if I run it again, it should work. Okay, so now we get to see what the actual site looks like. So there's enough in this template to actually run it and see the basic functionality, right? Notice it comes up with this uh, uh, partial view up top. This is for uh, the cookie policy. Once I accept it, it goes away and then I can see the actual menu system. This is a nav bar. The system uses Bootstrap. We quickly talked about that the other day. That's a, a CSS framework developed originally by Twitter, open sourced and then taken over by a very active uh, open source community that maintains and is always adding new features. Very nice system, it works very well. One thing that it does give us is immediately everything is responsive, right? So you'll notice as the screen size goes down to say more of a tablet, right? Things will switch from a horizontal to a vertical. Even uh, graphic images will often just get a little smaller. Eventually at one point, see how the menu changed from being across the top? And then we get the hamburger menu dropping down. And this is all just built into the framework. It's actually quite easy to use and expand upon. So we'll be definitely working with Bootstrap in the course itself. Right? You can keep on going right down to a mobile device and see how it works. Okay. All right. We're back to a full screen. So just while I'm here, I'll point out one other thing. If we just look, watch the address bar as I click these menu selections. Okay. Remember we talked about routing how data, all the requests get routed to a controller first. So when I click this link, the controller is the home controller, the action is the about action, right? If I click contact, then we've called the contact action of the home controller. And by the way, if I click on this one, it seems to disappear, but it's really just called the index action of the home controller, which is also what you get when you click this at the moment as well, <laughs> right? They both take you to the same place. So. We'll see how that works in code in just a moment here. So I'll stop running for now. And uh, let's focus on the uh, Solution Explorer itself. So if we look at the different files we see here, startup, okay, that's to do with all, all, setting all the configuration that we need for starting up. 
program CS, that's pretty simple. Void main, right? If you've ever done any other Windows programming, you know, often console applications, Windows desktop applications, usually the first thing you hit is a void main, <laughs> right? That's the main uh, method call to get the program up and going. So we have something similar here. App settings, okay, this is a JSON file. Are you familiar with JSON format? JavaScript object notation, right? Really just as like name value pairs, but it also supports a hierarchical arrangement. So uh, what we hear is connection strings. There's one predefined already with a connection string to local DB. We'll be using by default during development. Local DB is that same one you used last term, right? It's that scaled down miniature version, so to speak, of SQL Server. It, uh, instead of running as a service all the time on the computer, it's something that just, we load it up in memory and we run it, and when we're done, it gets removed from memory, right? So it's not running all the time. MS local DB, so it's setting up here for a, a database to hold all those security tables that we said we wanted. Users and roles and all that good stuff for logins, right? And there's a few other settings in here, not too much at the moment, right? But we'll be adding more stuff inside of this uh, app settings JSON file later on. Okay, what I really want to focus on right now, we'll get into more of the nitty gritty of that stuff later, is just look at this. Oh, I, M, model, V, views, C, controller. So we actually have an organized structure in our project, right, to go along with our MVC approach, right? Now we can actually look in here, if I go into controllers, here's my home controller. Notice, remember I pointed out that when we click those links in the nav bar already, we were basically calling the home controller. Inside the home, I can just make the font bigger. That's probably better than zooming in and out all the time. Uh, home controller just inherits from the controller class, right? So that's how it has all the smarts to do what it needs to do. And what we see are three action results, index, about, and contact, right? So that's exactly what we saw in our menu as well, which is calling these different actions inside the home controller. So it's a very simple approach, right? There's also this one down here uh, to do with the uh, uh, privacy settings and so on. Okay, but let me point out this. Notice inside each of these action results, what does it say? It says return. So that's going to return back to the requesting browser. View. Which view, right? How does it know which one to send? Well, anyway, this is the index action. There's a view, about action, view, contact, view, right? It's not specified, but this whole system depends very much on what they refer to as convention as opposed to configuration. Instead of having massive big configuration files saying, oh, well, when you click on this, do that, and this, do that, and this, do that, what they do is they just follow a simple naming convention, right? So if this is the home controller, and this is the name of the action, well, let's look at views to figure out which view we want. Coming over here to Views, I see a folder for Home. Right? That corresponds to the name of the controller. Inside here, I see the different views with the same names as the actions. So it's a simple naming convention is all it is. Right? You can override it in the controller. If you say Return View and give a name, then you can pick a different controller than the default. Right? But it makes it easy for us that it just knows by the name of the action, comes over here to the Views, finds the controller name, looks for a view with the same name as the action, and that's how it knows which one to return, right? And of course, it can bundle up some data. So as you see here, view data message, your application description page, right? So it, that gets passed. What view data is, essentially, remember we talked about in my illustration, the PowerPoint, you, you saw the uh, uh, controller would get like a briefcase of information and pass it off to the view, right? Well, really, it's kind of like an airline. You, you have your big luggage that you check, and that I compare to when we actually have a uh, strongly typed view where we have an actual model object. Maybe it's a collection of patients, for example, right? And that we pass over to the view, like checked luggage. But there's also carry-on. <laughs> carry-on luggage is that little bit of extra information that's not really the main data you're trying to show, but a little bit of extra stuff you just want to tuck in there as well. So that's your carry-on luggage, and that's what view data gives us. It's a dynamic collection, really a dictionary, where we just have a name and a value, a name-value pair. And you can just make up new ones, whatever you want. So the name is always a string, 
But the value, it doesn't have to be a string. It could be an object of some sort or another. It can hold anything you want. You can stick inside this dictionary, right? But then when we come to the About view, let's have a look at the code in there. So if I come over here to Views, Home, double-click the About view, right? Then here we see, oh, View Data Message. That's it. So it's inside of an H3 tag, and that will display on the page. So we're just tucking that into the carry-on luggage we're passing over to the view in the view data itself, right? And let's just run that again and see it actually. Notice there's a few, there's the title, right? And so on and so forth. So, well, I have to accept that every time. Okay, all right. If I go to the about, okay, your application, that's the string that we passed in our carry-on luggage, right? So it just shows up here. Notice it also has the about, right? Uh, that was in the uh, view bag or the view data as well and so on and so forth. All right, so that's, you know, the basics of how the views and the controllers work is covered in that tutorial. So I'm not going to beat it to death. That's probably enough for me to talk about it for now, right? Uh, because the other aspect is the models, right? Now there is something here, an error view model, but this is where we'll add our own models as well. Our models represent the data domain. But remember I mentioned that this time around, instead of going to the database, designing our tables, writing create table statements, defining primary foreign key relationships and all that stuff, we are going to take a code first approach. In that code first approach, right, we're going to actually define our conceptual models that the whole system is based on and we'll let Entity Framework go and build the database. Okay, Maybe I'll stop and start recording to break up the recording a little bit.